Let's go back to our dynamo effect really quickly. That is forcing, that is supplying a force to a wire in a magnetic field and it cuts the magnetic field lines and we get a current being produced in the wire so long as it's part of a complete circuit. By the way, if it's not part of a complete circuit, then we will not have a current produced at all. So we know that current isn't the only thing that we're interested in. We're interested in the energy supplied to the electrons, or rather the number of joules supplied to each coulomb of charge. You probably know that we're heading towards voltage. We're not actually talking about voltage as such. We're actually talking about the induced EMF. And that has the symbol epsilon. That does have the unit volts, but that's also the same as joules per coulomb. How much energy is supplied to each coulomb of charge. So let's just get a magnetic field and let's have our piece of wire of length L. That is part of a circuit, but we're only interested in the length of the wire that's in the magnetic field. Let's say that we push this wire downwards. We push it down with a force F. If we push it forever and ever, through a magnetic field, we're gonna get infinite energy, but we're going to push it down to here. So it's gone that distance there. We're gonna call this delta S, S being displacement. So we've moved it through a distance delta S. Now we know that EMF is work done and again, that's energy, isn't it? Divided by charge. But you should remember that work done is force times distance. So this is F delta S. And we also know that charge is equals to current times time. But do you remember from our motor effect, what force is produced? due to the motor effect, that's gonna be the same as the force that we're working against. So this is also gonna be B I L. So what do we end up with? The EMF induced in this wire is going to be B I L delta S divided by I delta T. Flux density times current times length times distance moved divided by current times time, how long it takes. The eyes disappear. Now what have we got here? We have L times delta S, that's the length of the wire times the distance moved. Now we can think about that as the area of flux that we're sweeping our wire through. So this ends up being B A divided by delta T. Hang on a minute, we got flux density times area, that's actually our flux. So this ends up being delta phi by delta t. We have just derived Faraday's law. That is, induced EMF is equal to the rate of change of flux. In other words, a wire needs to experience a change in flux. Now, that could be to a couple of reasons, but here, this wire is cutting through the flux lines, so it is experiencing a change there. So this change in flux can be due to various reasons. It could be due to a changing flux density, or it could be just a wire cutting magnetic field lines. But when it comes to the dynamo effect and inducing EMF in a wire, the area of the wire is incredibly important. Even though the EMF is just being induced in the wire at a certain time going down, the area is very important. Now, there is one thing that we're missing from our Faraday's law there, and that's a little minus. Why do we put a minus there? Well, that's due to Lenz's law. So this is Faraday's law. So the minus isn't that important because usually we're just concerned with the rate of change of flux itself. We don't care whether that's a positive change in flux or negative, but we do put the minus in front when we state Faraday's law to show that the EMF induced does oppose the change in flux that caused it to begin with. Faraday's law is the most important equation when it comes to electromagnetic induction.
Now let's just apply Faraday's law to this specific example here. If we're moving a wire perpendicular to the magnetic field, so it's cutting the field lines perfectly, then we can find out the EMF this way. Let's go back to here. We had the EMF is equals to B L delta S over delta T. But well, hold on a second, we have delta S, that's the distance it's moved, divided by the time it takes to do that. Distance divided by time, that's actually speed. Velocity. So the EMF induced in a wire that's cutting field lines perpendicularly is B L V. So let's look at a few specific examples of how we can calculate the EMF induced in a cord of wire. Let's say that we have a magnetic field and it has a very clear boundary. And we have a rectangular coil and it's going to move into the magnetic field. Now we know that this wire, when it starts cutting flux lines, we're going to have an EMF induced in it. But when the other side of the coil also is in the field and cutting the flux lines in the same way, then we're going to have an EMF induced in each side, which is going to cancel each other out. So we should only have an EMF while the coil is entering the magnetic field. And that is the case. We can think about it in those terms, but we know that EMF is equals to the rate of change of flux. BA is our flux divided by time. So we can think about it in terms of how much area of the coil is actually filled up, as it were, with flux. Let's have a think about if the coil is halfway inside. Only half of the coil's area has been filled up by flux. But as it keeps going in, more and more of the coil's area gets filled up with magnetic flux. So that means that we still haven't changed in area. Once it's all the way inside, the whole thing is filled up with flux, and that doesn't change while it's completely inside the magnetic field. On its way out, we again have a change in area, so we should have an EMF induced. So when do we have an EMF? Not when it's outside, but we do as it's entering. Once it's inside, we don't, but as it's exiting, we do. Now we can draw two graphs to show what's going on. We can draw a graph of flux against time, and we can draw a graph of EMF against time, the induced EMF. So to begin with, we have no flux because it's outside of the magnetic field, so we have a straight line. But as it's entering, the amount of flux that fills up the coil will increase. When it's all the way inside, the flux is constant. And then as it's exiting, it comes back down again. What does that mean for the EMF? Well, we're obviously not going to have any EMF induced while it's outside, but remember that EMF is rate of change of flux. In other words, EMF is the gradient of this. So the gradient is constant. In other words, the rate of change of flux is constant. So we're just going to jump straight to a value of our EMF. And it's going to stay constant while it's entering the field. Once it's all the way inside, even though it's completely filled up with flux, the flux isn't changing. So actually, it goes back down to zero. Even though we've got flux, we don't have any EMF because it's not changing. As it's exiting, the coil is being emptied of its flux. So the flux is changing, but we're going to have an EMF induced in the opposite direction. And then once it's outside, our EMF is zero again. So just to be clear, when we have a uniform magnetic field and a coil entering and exiting, we always get this sort of digital form of our EMF. Technically, the EMF should be minus the rate of change of flux because of Lenz's law. So I probably should put a minus in front of there. And how do we figure out what the EMF actually is? Well, this is just a piece of wire moving through. So again, it's going to be BLV. What about if we have stationary coils? There's various ways that you can set up two stationary coils. 
one is producing a magnetic field and the other one is inducing an EMF in it because of that. So let's say that we have a coil like that and it has an area A. If you look lengthways down this coil, that's its area. That's the area of the coil inducing the EMF. Let's say that we have another coil around it that is producing the magnetic field. We don't really care about the area of the coil that's producing the EMF, that's producing the magnetic field. We only care about the flux density that it creates for the coil inside. Now we said that EMF is equals to rate of change of flux and flux is BA. Now with all our moving coils and spinning coils and all that jazz, what's changing? Well the area is changing but in this case the area isn't changing so it's B that's changing. So what we're going to do is take A out of there because that's staying constant and we're going to say that that is true instead. A is constant, so we take it out of the whole changing business, and we want to know how fast the flux density is changing. And by the way, this is important, this is the only way that this coil could induce an EMF. Because it's not moving, it has to experience a change in magnetic flux density. That's why this coil here has to be attached to an AC supply, because if it was DC, then it would produce a magnetic field, but the flux density wouldn't be changing. So nothing would be induced in the secondary coil here. So that we have something that's a flux density that goes from 10 milliteslas to zero milliteslas in 50 milliseconds. Then that means that our rate of change of flux density is just gonna be 0.01 divided by 0.05. That gives us 0.2. Now let's say that the area of this coil is 0.1 meters squared. So what I'd have to do then is take my rate of change of flux density times by my area here, and I should have the EMF induced in the coil. But here's the thing, is that this EMF is gonna be the amount of flux that is induced in just one loop of the coil. Whereas in reality, we've got lots of loops or lots of turns as we call them. And that's going to be the case in pretty much every coil that you have. It's very unusual to have just one loop like this. If you've got a coil, whether it's rectangular or circular, coils usually have lots of turns. So we have to take this into account. So we say the number of the turns in a coil equals n. We say flux is equals to BA. If we multiply up by the number of turns in a coil, we have something that's basically flux, but we give it a different name. It's called flux linkage. And because it is something slightly different, we do say that the unit for flux linkage is Weber turns, not just Weber. So EMF induced in a coil is actually going to be BAN divided by T. I've left off the deltas there, but they are implied. So this is EMF equals rate of change of flux linkage, not just flux. It's exactly the same. This N is taken into account that we have several turns in a coil. So let's say that our N for this coil here, we actually have 10 turns in our coil here. So all we have to do is take our rate of change of flux density, and we figured out that's 0.2, times by the area, which you said is 0.1, then times by 10, lo and behold, still ends up coming out 0.2 volts. We found out the EMF induced in a coil by taking our area of the coil, times it by the number of turns in the coil, and times it by our rate of change of flux density. Incidentally, it would be the same up here. If this rectangular coil had several turns behind it, then actually this would be equals to N BLV. Everything that we've done so far works for a coil of wire with just one loop or one turn. All we have to do to find out the EMF for a coil with several turns is times by the number of turns. What about if we have a plane? It's cutting the flux of the earth as it goes along. It's made out of metal and it's cutting field lines, so we should have an EMF induced 
in the plane. It's going to have its own eddy current induced in the plane. It's just going to go round and round and it's going to heat up the plane ultimately. Well, how do we figure out what the EMF induced in the plane is? So it's traveling along at a speed V. And as per usual, we need to know the area of flux that is swept out. So it's going to sweep out if it goes along here. This area of flux. That's our A. And we have the width of our plane as well. That's the wingspan. So we know that EMF is equals to B A over T, or rather I'm going to stick a delta T in there. Now we're going to assume that the flux density stays constant, so we need a way of finding out what area is swept through every second. You might have guessed that if we do BWV, that's the flux density times the width of the plane times its speed, this is meter squared per second, that is that is the area swept through every second. So there you go. Whatever situation you're confronted with, this is the most important equation, Faraday's law here. Either the area is changing and you need to find out how the area is changing every second, or everything's stationary and it's just the flux density that's changing every second.